The first order of business is that we need to take a roll to determine who is present. The clerk, Mr. Peterson, will now take the roll. Chair Joaquin? Present. Joaquin, present. Vice Chair Gomez? Present. Gomez, present. Representative Hurtas? Representative Hurtas? Hurtas just showed up. Hurtas present, welcome. Representative Anderson? Anderson present. Anderson present. Representative Becker Finn? Present. Becker Finn present. Representative Fisher? Fisher present. Fisher present. Representative Green? Present. Green present. Representative Hassan? Present. Hassan present. Representative Her? Representative Her? Representative Marcourt? Representative Marcourt? Representative Mortensen? Here. Mortensen present. Representative Pulowski? Pulowski present. Pulowski present. Representative Torkelson? Present. Torkelson present. Representative Her? Representative Marcourt? Present. Marcourt present. There is a quorum, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Peterson. I want to note that all the committee documents for today have been sent to members and are on the committee page on the House website. Um, the first item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes from February 24th. Representative Gomez, have you had a chance to review the minutes? I have, Madam Chair. I'd like to move their approval, please. Thank you. Does anyone have any question about the minutes? Seeing none, we'll move on to a vote. Um, this is a voice vote, so members, please briefly unmute yourself when you vote. All those in favor of approving the February 24th minutes, say aye. 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 All those opposed, say nay. The motion is approved and the minutes are adopted. And Representative Hur has now um, joined us. So before we start on our first bill, I just want to remind members, we added back into your packets the memo on the local office sales tax that we've gone over in committee before with some of the you know, questions you may want to ask or some of the parameters we're looking at um, for local option sales tax. Um, Mr. Swanson has also put together um, a great sheet that the cities have provided information on about the city levy and, and tax rate information. And he's put together a sheet kind of describing which each of the columns are as well that are also in your packet. So with that, members, we will move on to the first bill, and that is uh, Representative Sundin's bill, House File 355. Can I get a motion to move House File 355 before the division? Madam Chair, so moved. Uh, Representative Gomez has moved House File 355 before the division. We have the bill before us now, Representative Sandine, to your bill. Representative Sandine, you just have to unmute. I did once before, but okay. Uh, th thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, House File 355 authorizes the city of Cloquet to collect a half cent sales tax on. Uh, uh, all taxable goods and services within the city. Uh, 355 uh, describes uh, the collection of the, uh, the revenues. Uh, it also gives a uh, bonding authority for the city to uh, uh, move forward with their plans. And uh, there's a termination on that as well. So uh, rather than belabor you with all the details, I will say that uh, the City of Cloquet has had a half cent sales tax for the past number of years and utilized it quite well for uh, services and uh, uh, within the city. When I say services, I, I mean uh, uh, road repairs, uh, street maintenance, and uh, recreational uh, uh, facilities uh, within the city. And uh, with me today, I have uh, Councillor Kerry Kalaji that uh, will uh, give you some more details on the intentions of the city of Cloquet with their half cent sales tax. I'll uh, remind everyone that the uh, present sales tax 
is expiring. So we're not doubling up uh, on the taxpayers or the, uh, the shoppers in the city of Cloquet. So uh, with me, uh, Carrie Kalaji. And Council Member Kalaji, could you please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony? My name is Perry Kalaji, last name spelling K-O-L-O-D-G-E. Thank you to Representative Sundin. Madam Chair and members of the committee, good afternoon. My name is Perry Kalaji. I'm a city councilor in Cloquet. Here with me is uh, City Administrator Tim Peterson as well. Thank you for allowing me the chance to address this committee on behalf of the city and our desire to seek sales tax funding for projects of regional significance. The city is seeking to fund two separate projects, the Pine Valley Regional Park and Coloque Ice Arena Restoration and Repair. For the Pine Valley Regional Park project, we are seeking sales tax funds totaling $2,124,700 to repair and restore the ski jumps, replace the chalet, pave the parking lot, improve facility lighting, and expand and light the mountain bike and cross country ski trails. For the Cloquia Ice Arena project, we are seeking sales tax funding totaling $6,025,500 to replace the ice plant and floor, replace the roof, improve facility lighting, restroom renovations to improve handicap accessibility, and several other small improvements. So combined, the city of Cloquet is requesting a one half percent sales tax for an estimated 10 years to fund the $8,150,200 in projects. As I will explain, as far as regional significance, each of these projects provides substantial regional support and impact to Northern Minnesota. I'll start with the first project, Pine Valley Park. Pine Valley Park is a city-owned recreation area recognized both locally and regionally as a multi-purpose outdoor recreation and sporting area. Created in 1961, Pine Valley Park has four ski jumps from five meters to 45 meters in height, Nordic skiing with a 5.5K competition level course, five miles of single track mountain biking, snowshoeing, snowmobiling, trail running, and hiking. Pine Valley Park also facilitates numerous hosted events with the uh, chalet being a focal point for these events in both winter and summer. Multiple sporting events are held at Pine Valley Park, many of these during the winter season. The Cloquet Nordic Ski Club's family outings, which include cross country skiing and ski jumping are held each Sunday and are attended by over 100 children and their families. Pine Valley Park's 45 meter ski jump is one of only two such ski jumps located in Northern Minnesota. The Cloquet Nordic Ski Club sponsors jumping and Nordic events all ski season, which brings in participants from as far away as Chicago. Recreational cross country skiers come from around the area and around the state to ski at this facility due to its competitive course and excellent grooming. Pine Valley Park has produced two Olympians Mike Randall and Patrice Jankowski, as well as several individual state ski champions and numerous state ski team champions, champ championships. The next project is the Cloquet Ice Arena Restoration and Repair Project. As some background, in 2018, the city of Cloquet sponsored an ice arena study to determine the long-term viability of this regional hockey facility, which was originally constructed in 1996. The study identifies numerous repairs and upgrades needed to ensure continued safe use of this facility into the future. This regional facility is used 11 months out of the year for hockey and skating. It is home to the Minnesota Wilderness Hockey Team, one of 20 North American Hockey League Tier 2 junior hockey teams. The Wilderness play 36 games per season, averaging over 46,000 fans in attendance. In an economic impact study conducted by the Labovitz School of Business and Economics at UMD, it was estimated that Carleton County sees $2.4 million in additional spending in this community due to the Wilderness Organization being located here. The Wilderness Organization is also credited with, with the creation of 29 new jobs, both directly and indirectly. 
half through operational spending and the other half from visitor spending in the areas of leisure and hospitality. The Colloquia Ice Arena is also home to the Colloquia Amateur Hockey Association with over 300 families participating in youth hockey from our region. The association hosts hockey tournaments an average of 20 weekends per year with at least 46 teams traveling from outside the Carleton County area to participate. The Cloakey Ice Arena has also produced two Olympians, Corey Millen and Jamie Langerbrunner. Jamie Langerbrunner was a captain of the two, 2010 U.S. Olympic hockey team. There have been two Stanley Cup winners and several professional hockey players that played their youth hockey in this arena. So in summary, the two projects I've discussed will benefit residents and businesses in the city of Cloquet, as well as the surrounding area. These facilities attract visitors and competitors from a wide area. There is truly a regional draw to both Pine Valley Park and the Cloquet Ice Arena. <clears throat> Funding for these projects cannot come from local property taxes as the burden would be too great. For the reasons I've mentioned, the community and city council support the authority to impose a general local sales tax of one half percent for an estimated period of 10 years to assist in funding these two projects. As a final note, these facilities have been absolutely packed with users seeking outdoor activities during the COVID pandemic. It is hard to overstate the value of these, faci these facilities bring to our residents and those who visit Coloque from outside the area. Thank you for allowing me to explain why these facilities are so important to our city and our region. It is our goal to upgrade them for current users and preserve them for future generations. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have at this time. Thank you, Councilmember Kalaji. Um, Representative Sandin, I think you have another testifier as well. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we have uh, City Administrator Tim Peterson on tap to answer any questions. Wonderful, then we'll just go to member questions. Members, do we have any questions for Representative Sandin or uh, Council Member Kalaji? Give it one more second. Madam Chair. Um, yes, Representative Hurtas. Uh, Representative Sundin, what Minnesota lake is behind you there? <laughs> Representative Sundin. Uh, Chair Joachim and, uh, uh, and Representative, that is actually Lake Superior, I think. <laughs> All right, members, any other questions? Representative Sundin, do you have any closing comments? Just a just thank you to uh, 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 Council, Councilman uh, Kalaji, and uh, I would invite anybody uh, from around the state to come visit that uh, Pine Valley Recreation Area. It's a beautiful site. Uh, my family has spent uh, many, many hours in the hockey rinks and out on the ski jumps as well in the past. So uh, uh, please come see what uh, the uh, Levy Authority can do for your community or your community as it has done for mine. Thank you, Repres Representative Sandine. Representative Gomez renews her motion that House File 355 be laid over for possible inclusion in the division report. The bill's been laid over. Next up, we have uh, Representative Igo here with House File 693. Can I get a motion to move House File 693 before the division? So moved, Madam Chair. Representative Herr moves uh, House File 693 before the division. And we have an author's amendment, I believe, labeled A21. Can I get a motion to move A21 so we can get the bill in the shape that the author would like? So moved, Madam Chair. This is Representative Herr. Thank you, Representative Herr. Representative Herr moves House uh, A21 amendment as well. Um, members, any questions? On, well, actually, I'll have Representative Eichel. Do you want to just briefly describe the amendment? And then we'll see if people have questions. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. So this amendment would just get the bill in the shape that the city of Grand Rapids has requested that we originally had it in. Um, so essentially, it's changing the $10.9 million number to a $5.9 million number and puts in a line there that uh, puts a little bit more of a timeline on the sunset. Um, and that really is the shape of the amendment itself. So. 
we, we just get the bill in the shape that the city of Grand Rapids likes, and it would be incredibly helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Igon. Welcome to the Property Tax Committee. Uh, members, do I have any questions on the A21 amendment? Seeing none, members, please unmute yourself. This will be a voice vote. All those in favor of the A21 amendment, please say aye. 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 Those, oppo those opposed say no. The motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. We have the bill before us. Representative Igo, why don't you go ahead and present your bill? Thank you, Madam Chair. And kind of following up from the previous, we're talking about a hockey arena again. So um, this, this bill would be to help pay for the Grand Rapids IRA Civic Center, um, which is a staple of the Grand Rapids community. Um, apart from hosting our, um, our hockey programs, it also is a prime attraction for weddings, boat shows, it's an event center. Um, it's been a staple of Grand Rapids for a long time. So uh, I have two testifiers with me today. I have our city administrator, Tom Pagel, and then our council member, Rick Blake. They're gonna give a little bit of a presentation on, uh, on more to what this project is, but thank you again for having me here and I'll let them take it away. Thank you, Representative Eichel. Mr. Uh, Pagel, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you, Chair. My name is Tom Pagel. I am the city administrator for the city of Grand Rapids. Today, we also have council member Rick Blake with us uh, to also uh, participate in the presentation. Chair, um, me did move? you want to go first? Or did you want to have the council member go first? Um, I'll take, uh, we have three slides. I'll take the first slide. Uh, council member Blake will take the second and then I'll close on the third. I don't believe we have the slides with us. Did um, I will ask um, Mr. Okay. Peterson or Mr. <laughs> or Mr. Justin? That's okay, Chair, Madam Chair. Okay, Mr. Justin, do we want to let him share his screen, or should we just uh, go ahead and have him? He can share his screen. The um, the uh, slides were also sent to members, um, so either of those works. Okay, whatever whatever you would like to do, Mr. Pagel. We'll just verbal if, if you're okay with that, Madam Chair. Sounds good. Okay. So uh, as Representative Igo has mentioned, the IRA Civic Center really serves as a regional facility and we'll, we'll talk about that in just a minute. But first, uh, a little highlight on the improvements. We originally built this facility in 1962. So we are going to be replacing the truck, truss and roof system on the West Venue. We're going to be replacing the refrigeration system for the ice making uh, at the West, West facility that was constructed in 1968. We're going to be doing a major uh, improvement on ADA within the building, including a new elevator. And then we'll be replacing the uh, HVAC systems that were original from 1962 and 68. Council member Blake. Councilmember Blake, go ahead and introduce yourself for the record, please, and proceed. Uh, Councilmember Blake, you'll have to unmute. Sorry. Thank you. Madam Chair, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to uh, testify today. Um, I want to talk about the regional impact and the public safety aspects of the project. Um, Independent School District 318 is a major tenant with over 60% non-city non -city students. The Grand Rapids Amateur Hockey Association is a major tenant with almost 65% of their members non-city non -city, um, residents. The facility is a countywide emergency shelter and it also serves as the evacuation facility for the nearby high school. The University of Minnesota estimates that 55% of the sales tax would be generated by non-residents. And now back to city administrator Pagel to address funding. Before we do that, uh, Council Member Blake, can you just please state your name for the record? Council, my name is Rick Blake and city councilor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pagel, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. The funding uh, for the project, total project cost is just a little bit under 11 million. I wanna thank the representatives here today 
for providing state bonding this past fall in the amount of $5 million. So the city is seeking authority to collect local sales tax at the level of 5,980,000. We are looking uh, for authority to impose a one half percent sales tax, uh, which was just in the requested amendment and up to, or up to seven years, uh, whichever comes first. So with that, uh, Ma Madam Chair, we would be open for questions. Thank you, Mr. Pago. Members, do we have any questions? Members are very quiet today. I'll ask a quick question. Did I hear you correctly to say that you did get money in the bonding bill from this last year? We did. Mr. Pagel. Okay. Uh, Madam Chair, we did. Thank you very much. Thank you. Members, any questions? With that, not seeing any questions. Um, they, uh, Representative Igo, do you have any closing comments? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Just want to close and say thank you again to the committee and to yourself for letting this bill be heard today uh, for my hometown of Grand Rapids and the IRA Civic Center. Thank you, Representative Iga. With that, uh, Representative Her renews her motion that House File 693 as amended be laid over for possible inclusion in the division report. The bill's laid over. Um, next, we have House File 514, also from Representative Igo. Can I get a motion to move House File 514 before the division? So moved, Chair. I, I represent Marquardt, I heard first. So he beat you to it. I'm sorry, Representative Hurtas. Representative Hurtas can have this one. I'll take the next one. Okay. <laughs> Representative, Hurt, Representative Hurtas? Well, uh, thank you for yielding, Representative Marquardt. Uh, I will move House File 514 for be laid over for possible inclusion in division. Um, Representative Hurtas lays, uh, moves 514 before the committee to be laid over for possible inclusion. Uh, Representative Igo, why don't you go ahead and um, explain your project? Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, so uh, House File 514 would be uh, also instituting another local option sales tax. This is for the Itasca County, my home county. The county's in the process of building a new jail that has been um, uh, part of their plan due to the uh, Department of Corrections. So this jail is gonna be at the cost of $75 million. This, uh, this optional sales tax would help pay for that and help our community um, build this jail that is essentially important. With me today is County Commissioner Terry Snyder and I will let him take over and kind of talk about the, uh, the details more as he's been kind of the lead on this project back in my county. Commissioner Snyder, why don't you go ahead and state your name for the record and proceed. Thank you, uh, good afternoon. Terry Snyder, County Commissioner with Itasca County. Uh, last name is S-N-Y-D-E-R. Go ahead with your presentation. Madam Chair, uh, members and Representative Igo, thank you for your valuable time this afternoon. Um, as, uh, as aforementioned, uh, the state of Minnesota, the Department of Corrections has sunset our current jail facility necessitating a, a new build. Uh, originally, our uh, uh, jail was built in 1981 with a small annex addition in 1977, or excuse me, 1997, uh, which created a 110 bed facility, which is now deemed obsolete. Uh, we've never brought a sales uh, option to the uh, legislature to this point. So Itasca County does not have a sales tax at this time. Uh, nearly 40% of our population, which is 45,000, uh, over the county is 62 years of age or older, resulting in a large portion of our residents that are on fixed incomes and rely on, rely on that income. Approximately 50% of our house, households are dual income households, uh, but the fact is that half of those uh, make 50,000 annually or less. So that puts us in the 14% poverty rate, which is quite high in comparison to across the state. Itasca County is the third largest geographically. 65% uh, of our land uh, is in public ownership and that would be state, federal, uh, county tax forfeit and, and some others. But what it does is it dilutes and limits our property tax ability as far as capacity and, and base. And it puts an enormous burden 
on the 45,000 residents that are that are in our in our county. So I'll take you back to our sunset letter that the county received in 2018, um, which basically uh, indicated that the Department of Corrections no longer would allow the use of this jail uh, beyond a, a point, which is uh, 2021. And so immediately the county board did act and created a task force. And the goal behind that was to uh, number one, investigate the issue and see what our options potentially could be, but also to, to be transparent with our public in what the process would be. So the task force met for uh, approximately 14, 15 months and came back to the county board with uh, findings and recommendations, and that was to build a new facility. Uh, they'd met numerous times with the Department of Corrections and found it, uh, it just wasn't able to use the current facility because of the way it was built in 1981 to uh, meet the, the needs of uh, programming and space needs for new facilities. In addition, they uh, indicated that there should be upgrades to the safety of the courthouse in terms of, of just general uh, safety, as far as one entrance and those types of things. And also uh, we lacked uh, safety for our court personnel, our, our judicial. So the county board at that point then decided that we would take this to, uh, to our constituents and your constituents. So we uh, scheduled 35 town hall meetings across the entire county from every corner to every corner. Uh, we did that between late fall of 2020 until March of 2021 when COVID shut most of us down. What we learned uh, in those town hall meetings and we met with thousands at this point was that of course they weren't happy with a, with a having to build a new facility or fund a new facility, but that it was necessary uh, because it did uh, create public safety and they were it's very important in our communities. The second piece that we discussed and, and probably equally as important is how does this, how is this funded? And so the options were given to our public at these meetings that obviously it would be a residential or commercial tax depending on what you were an owner of or that we would seek a uh, seek legislative authority to uh, impose a 1% sales tax across the county for the duration uh, to pay off the indebtedness. During the personal town hall meetings, uh, it was overwhelming uh, that the citizens wanted a sales tax. So the county board took that into account and additionally created a survey that was sent out publicly, social media, in person, many, many different ways uh, with results coming back uh, that 75% through the public survey, not in person, the public survey also wanted the option to uh, pay for the jail through a 1% sales tax versus being placed on property or commercial tax. So Itasca County really is no different than, than most of the counties in Northern Minnesota. Uh, and the fact that you know we're, we're kind of islands of our own. So when you look at what, what really caused our problem was we've grown out of our old jail and in many instances had to house prisoners to other counties. And that was a, an extreme expense and it was uh, costly in terms of the transportation as well. In fact, in any one given day on average, we had 37 uh, inmates in other counties. This is true with, with all of our surrounding counties, St. Louis, Kuchiching, and uh, Crow Wing uh, to the west of us, and Beltrami. Much of, much of northern Minnesota lacks the adequate inmate bed, bed space, particularly with female residents. The new facility that we're proposing would address these needs uh, for ourselves and also regionally. Um, so what we presented last year that we didn't have that we now have this year and it's included in members packet is that we received letters of support from St. Louis County, Beltrami County and Kuchiching County sheriffs indicating that you know, they still have um, needs for uh, housing prisoners out of county and that they would utilize Itasca County uh, for that need. In addition, the Department of Corrections has also indicated that they're very interested in long-term bed lease uh, from our facility for their needs as well. And I think that it, it brings uh, a good point is that not only are we helping our partners and our neighbors regionally, next to us regionally, 
in alleviating a potential problem they may have in overcrowding, but it also creates a, a revenue source. So the county board has committed in, uh, that any revenue that is generated as a result of uh, beds, because we have built larger than what our needs are uh, at this point, would be used uh, to buy down the liability or the, the bond that we have. So in addition to the 1% sales tax, we have, we have the, the length and we really think it's going to be closer to 21, 22 years than what's indicated. Uh, we would also use these uh, alternate revenue sources to help uh, buy that down and shorten the length. So in addition to the jail, and I will close with this, is that you know, it provides us an opportunity that we've never had in the past in uh, providing additional programming, including uh, culturally sensitive programming and, and training. It'll be incorporated into the new facility and should, and we hope, would improve uh, inmate outcomes and re reduce recidivism. In addition, uh, the State Department of Corrections has provided a letter of support that they are very willing to expand our cognitive skills building and domestic viol violence programming within our inmate population. So the, the, again, we're in the process. It's a, it's a project in motion. We have not went to bids, but we are looking at uh, no greater than 75 million. And we're in the process now of, of uh, whittling that down. So it would be some, certainly something less than that. And, and part of the bill indicated 30 years. And as I previously stated, we're hoping that that will be somewhere around the 21, 22 years. So I will close with that and stand for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Snyder. Members, do we have any questions for Commissioner Snyder or Representative Igo? Uh, Representative Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Snyder, uh, it's quite a project that you are uh, contemplating here. And just have to ask you if you've established any kind of a daily rate yet for uh, uh, housing prisoners and do you have assurances from your neighboring counties that they would uh, they would take so many beds per day to give you some assurances as far as cash flowing this type of a facility you're looking at uh, building? Um, Commissioner, you, I, Commissioner Snyder. Thank you, Representative. Um, th that's a great question, and there's some variables that come into play with that. So again, it depends on the prisoner need. But on average, uh, those daily rates run between $45 and $65 a day. And that would, again, determine, uh, be predetermined if you're male or female. And then if there are any uh, extra conditions that would have to go with this prison. Representative Anderson, any follow up? Yeah, Madam Chair, again, thank you. Um, I've been involved in a little bit of uh, some jail planning back in my home counties and, and uh, you know, operating jails is expensive. And, and again, you didn't mention about if you have anything more than just a verbal agreement from your neighboring counties, because if you're gonna be counting on, on, on income coming in from prisoners from other counties, um, you need to kind of, I think, nail that down to get some uh, solid assurances of how many beds a day that they would guarantee use. But uh, if you can't, if you can't get that, I understand that, but but I would advise trying to to get some of those some of those numbers nailed down as you as you proceed with this. Thank you, Commissioner Snyder. Any response? Thank you, Representative. That's a, a great point, and we are in the process right now of working on those agreements. Um, as it stands, it's not uh, the extra revenue is not part of the budget. Uh, because we don't have uh, signatures on papers that actually commit, but we are in the process of that right now. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Representative Anderson, any other follow-up? Okay. Members, any other questions for Representative Igo or Commissioner Anderson, or Commissioner Snyder, sorry. Members seeing none, Representative Iko, uh, would you like to have some final comments? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just wanna thank uh, Commissioner Snyder for being here today and all the work that the county has done. As he kind of said in his testimony, the county's done a very good job of reaching out to all of uh, the constituents of Itasca County to hear what their concerns are for making this jail happen to have to uh, increase our public safety for our county and keep us all safe um, in, in a good way. I also wanna thank you, Madam Chair, and the members of the committee for hearing this bill today and thank you all for your time. Thank you, Representative Igo. Uh, Representative Hurtas renews his motion that House File 514 be laid over 
for possible inclusion in the division report and uh, the bill is laid over. Next bill on the agenda we have is House File 1345 from Representative Bonner. Can I get a motion to move House File 1345 before the division? Madam so Chair, I will move the bill. So uh, thank you, Representative Marquardt. Mar Representative Marquardt moves House File 1345 before the division. We now have a bill before us, Representative Bonner, to your bill. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members. Um, Maple Grove is a thriving community with a plethora of things going for it, uh, including a community center that serves as the go-to place for seniors and pickleball, aqua aerobics, and a splash down the Grove Cove water slide, from basketball to birthday parties, banquets to bustling conferences, and sports tournaments to weddings. Uh, while the area population has grown by a robust 28 percent in the past 25 years since the community center opened, its visitors have become as diverse as the wide array of people it serves, from toddlers to teens to sports enthusiasts and seniors. As the services of Maple Grove Community Center have grown, so has the communities it serves. Increasingly, we see that the Maple Grove Community Center is becoming a gathering space for 650,000 visitors annually from around the region. The ever-growing needs of the surrounding community have fueled the need to expand and to renovate, to meet the vision of the future. Uh, members, the ask in the bill before the committee today is permission to do a half percent local option sales tax based on voter approval realized over 20 years or when the need has been met to cover the $90 million bond plus relevant bond fees. The expansion and renovation will include critical cost-saving measures to install energy efficient systems while renovating existing banquet and meeting space and expanding aquatic and athletic spaces. It will serve the needs of an age-friendly maple grove through greater services to our seniors and meet citizens where they are by expanding access to food and housing supports for the community. The changing needs of our community and our region are all met by this microcosm of diverse community. Members, uh, we thank you for your time and your consideration today, and I ask for your support of House File 1345. With that, Madam Chair, I have two distinguished guests with me today, uh, Mayor Mark Stephenson and City Administrator Heidi Nelson to speak to the bill. Mayor Stephenson, please uh, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Uh, thank you, Chair Yuakum. I'm Mark Stephenson, the Mayor of Maple Grove, uh, and thank you, Representative Bonner, for presenting our bill here today. Uh, and I want to thank all this, the representatives for their time as well. Uh, this obviously is our city's local option sales tax request for the expansion and renovation of the Maple Grove Community Center. Uh, the community center opened to the public in 1997. Uh, since that time, the population in the Northwest Metro has grown by over 28,000 people, or 28% to over 230,000 people. And the diversity of Maple Grove has expanded dramatically and has grown by over 13% during that period. Uh, the Maple Grove Community Center, as uh, noted by Representative Bonner, serves over 650,000 people a year um, to our many interactions, including seniors programs, a teen center, farmer's market, banquet and meeting rooms, aquatic facilities, ice arenas, and a skate park. Uh, the location of the community center uh, in the heart of the Northwest uh, Minneapolis Regional Commercial Trade Area makes it the center for a regional host for a series of meetings, expos, tournaments uh, that really uh, are statewide type events. Uh, the expansion and renovation project will expand offerings in many areas and they include the following. Uh, the current ice arena hosts about 230 uh, games, 40 clinics, and 16 tournament events annually. Uh, this uh, facility serves uh, athletes throughout the metro area and, and outstate Minnesota. The addition of a third sheet of ice would greatly increase the number of events hosted. Uh, the current banquet facility hosts 10 small business conferences and 30 weddings annually, serving patrons throughout the metro and the state. Again, expansion of these facilities will fill a gap in the Northwest Metro region for event venues of this type and bring numerous visitors to the community and local businesses. Uh, current event spaces annually host about 12 expos of various types 
to attract many vendors and visitors from outside the city. Uh, expansion of the event space would also allow for growth in that industry. Current aquatics facilities host daily field trips during the summer, of which 80% are outside of Maple Grove. In addition, 60% of the walk-in swimmers come from outside the city. Expansion of this facility provides for growth to serve a larger number of residents and visitors from the Northwest region. Uh, the community center is a host of many senior programs and drop-in activities. 34% of our senior patrons come from outside the community and the demographic growth in this area is very significant in our community and an expansion of these facilities would build on the strong senior patronage we already have. Uh, the proposed project also includes partnership with veteran services and nonprofit agencies that are intended to be housed in the facility that would provide food, housing, and social services to the community. We realize that it's important for the community to understand our local levy information, which has been provided to the community in advance of the hearing today. Um, the pursuit of this local sales tax option is in response to the overburden of this regional facility to our local taxpayers. Without the local sales tax option, the debt service requirement would require a 14.5% increase to the city residents, to our levy. Maple Grove taxpayers will be covering the operating expenses. Uh, that's the plan. The local option sales tax allows the city to broaden the base of who pays for this facility expansion, and that uh, will directly reflect the actual regional use. Uh, we greatly appreciate your time and I will turn it over to uh, Ms. Nelson for any additional comments that she might have. Um, before that, I wanna note that there was a late letter arriving of support from the North Metro mayors that um, CA Mr. Justin sent out. Um, with that, Ms. Nelson, welcome to the committee and please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you, Chair Yukim and members of the committee. My name is um, Heidi Nelson and I serve as the Maple Grove City Administrator. Is my audio kind of crackly? Just a little, little bit of an echo, but maybe uh, Mr. Uh, Mayor Stephenson, there you go. You now try that again. Um, okay. Ms. Nelson. All right. All right. Well, thank you again um, for your time today. I just want to kind of come provide a bit further comment on some of the, the mayor's comments about um, our growth up here in the Northwest Metro, as well as our, our levy. Um, as we noted, we have experienced over about 28% population growth in Maple Grove. And um, looking at our historical levy data, um, our levy on average over that same period of time has grown by about 4.65%. Um, so we are seeing, um, you know, tremendous growth in our population and, and we're having to keep up with that um, delivery of service by increases to our levy. Our five-year history of levy and tax rate has been more favorable to the taxpayer due to valuation growth and strong new construction up in the Northwest Metro. Um, as noted by the mayor, the request for the local option sales tax is due to the overburden of the cost of the expansion of this regional facility. And without the local option sales tax, we would, um, we would require that 14.5% increase in, in um, our levy for the debt service. As noted, um, that additional operating cost that the, the taxpayer will bear um, would require an additional 4.5% increase in the levy. So as proposed, we're asking for a half cent for 20 years to cover the capital costs of this uh, facility expansion renovation. And we believe it more accurately spreads uh, payment for the facility to its users, which includes those who travel to shop in and visit Maple Grove. Um, we appreciate your time today. We also have um, Chuck Stifter, our Director of Parks and Recreation on the call um, to respond to any questions that the committee may have. Thank you, Ms. Nelson. Members, or do we have any questions for Ms. Nelson, um, Mayor Stephenson, or Representative Bonner? Uh, Representative Hurtas. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, uh, Ms. Nelson, good to see you again. Good to um, see you. I uh, resided in Maple Grove, uh, lived in one of the developments that I built out there. Um, when we built the original community center, uh, center and I don't uh, recall that we use this type of instrument uh, for financing the project. Um, I'm a little concerned about our suburban districts adding sales tax uh, as a local option. We, I'm not aware of any uh, suburban areas in, in the metro area that are able to do that. Well, they're able to do it, but they haven't asked for it. And uh, Ms. Nelson uh, or Mayor uh, Stephenson, what 
is the tax capacity now in Maple Grove? Uh, I've witnessed and have contributed uh, to the growth of Maple Grove and building a lot of homes there. Um, I'm, I'm really questioning whether this is a want or a need. Uh, Ms. Nelson or uh, Mayor? Yeah. Ms. Nelson, go ahead. Thank you, Chair Joachim, Representative Hurtas. Um, so our tax, um, our valuation, or are you talking about our tax rates? Um, tax Representative, valuation? Representative Hurtas? I'm talking about your total tax capacity that you have the ability to apply your levy to. Sure. Ms. Nelson. So our, yes, I'm sorry, Chair Joachim, Representative Hurtas. Our total um, valuation that we can apply levy to is just around 10 billion. Um, so we, you know, Maple Grove, large growing community with good commercial industrial tax base. Um, and our current tax rate sits at that 31.847%. Representative Hurtas, follow up. Uh, thank you for uh, that information uh, that, um, you know, I, I see a lot of, uh, we see, not just I, but we as a committee see a lot of these uh, local option uh, sales tax provisions coming before us. Uh, some of them are truly infrastructure needs, and I don't intend to debate whether expansion of a community center is a need uh, or not, or additional sheets of ice. I, Recall also when we uh, uh, built a sheet of ice when I resided in Brooklyn Park, uh, we did uh, bonding uh, to do that and the uh, associations uh, played a heavy part in financing uh, as a user fee uh, some of these uh, activities. But um, what we're really seeing a trend here and one of my concerns about the expansion of lost provisions is that uh, as communities grow and, uh, and get bigger and bigger, uh, they become magnets for uh, people to do their commerce and shopping. And, and it's nice to add these extra uh, little shiny objects that again, attracts even more people and uh, more sales tax revenue, business revenue growing into these areas, oftentimes at the expense of the surrounding communities that don't have as much. So I've been supportive of uh, local option sales taxes for areas of low tax capacity and inability to levy the taxes locally and using the sales tax for that reason. Uh, but uh, I just wanted to express these concerns. I don't think it's a trend that we should be supporting as a committee. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Hurtas. Um, any comments, Representative Bonner or Mayor Stephenson or Ms. Nelson? Madam Chair, if I may. Uh, thank you, Representative Hurtas for that comment. And certainly I appreciate and understand your concerns. And as you know, um, Maple Grove has traditionally been very careful and thoughtful in its planning process um, and its budgeting as well. Um, so I, I have to be upfront that this is quite the extraordinary time to come before you and ask this because we have always been very thoughtful about how we do that and how we balance uh, the needs and desires of our taxpayers. Um, and I want to remind you that this is a, an option to put before the voters to ask if they would like to participate in this. We know other suburban areas have actually used this as an instrument to help cover the costs and reduce the burden to local taxpayers in other suburban cities. Um, uh, Bloomington, I believe Plymouth has a request. Um, there's a few others um, that have used this to really help uh, spread out uh, the cost of this investment to the folks who are actually using the facility. I think we've reached a, a, a place including Excelsior and I believe Rogers, I'm sorry, may also be among those. Um, you know, really this is a, a, an ability for us to spread out that cost, be fair to our taxpayers. And with the current usage of the facility, we're almost at a tipping point now where about 50% of the services and the visitors to that facility are actually coming from outside of Maple Grove. Uh, so it seems a, a reasonable and thoughtful uh, way to try and help fund that facility. And it represents her task follow up, otherwise I'll go to represent my court. Uh, thank you. And uh, I appreciate that Representative Bonner and I know that uh, you're doing your best to uh, represent uh, your community. Uh, I'll just kind of close with the idea that uh, 
you know, I, I live out that way. I live on that side of town. I resided in Maple Grove for a long time. I decided to move a little further out, but I have choices. Uh, I'm equidistant to drive into the shopping complexes of Maple Grove. I can uh, also go to Delano. I can also go to Buffalo. I can also go to Rogers. And um, from my perspective, if I have to pay another half cent sales tax for everything that I tend to purchase and tend to gravitate to the east towards Maple Grove, I'll probably shop somewhere else, but thank you. I'm representative Mark Court. So thank you very much, Madam Chair. And I, I do think probably in the suburbs, it is a little more difficult to maybe show a regional impact, but the fact that the Metro mayors have a letter of support here, I think really does signify that it does have a regional impact in this situation. And as Representative Bonner and, and Representative Hurtas has mentioned, I mean, there are other suburbs who, who do have uh, local option sales taxes, you know, and so this certainly isn't the first one, but um, just, just to say, I, I do think the fact that these mayors in the area are coming together and saying, hey, this is important for the area does indicate there's certainly some good regional significance to this. So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Mark Court. Um, any other questions, members? With that, Representative Bonner, final word. Yes, thank you for that. Um, I, I certainly appreciate the comments from Representative Hurtas and, and I'd like to say that I think and, and I hope that we are very proud of the amenities that we have in Maple Grove, the, the shopping areas, the restaurants and, and the local flavor. Uh, so certainly I hope that you will continue to come back for that, Representative Hurtas. Um, with that, certainly we are grateful for your time today and we look forward uh, to your recommendations, but certainly we are also grateful to the North Metro mayors and for our local communities uh, for supporting this measure um, and giving us the opportunity to really help uh, be thoughtful and responsible uh, to our taxpayers and also um, make sure that we can ensure that we have facilities that can meet the needs of our surrounding communities and region for generations to come. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Bonner. With that, um, Representative Marquardt renews his motion that House File 1345 be laid over for possible inclusion in the division report and the bill's laid over. The next bill we have on our agenda is House File 1458 from Representative Burkle. Can I get a motion to move House File 1340? Sorry, can I get a motion to move House File 1458 before the committee? Oh, move, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative Anderson moves that House File 1458 um, be before the division. We now have the bill before us. Representative Burkle, welcome to the Property Tax Committee <clears throat> and proceed with your comments. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, committee. Uh, got a local sales tax option, House File 1458 here for a child care center in Warren, Minnesota, um, proposing a half percent sales tax to build a 10,000 square foot facility uh, for about 110 children up in, in Northwestern Minnesota. Um, I have one testifier to keep things moving along. I see it's almost four o'clock. I'll uh, turn it over to uh, city administrator, um, Shannon Mortensen and I'll let her uh, give you more details. Ms. Mortensen, please state your name for the record and proceed. Shanna Mortensen, City Administrator for the City of Warren. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members, and thank you, Representative Burkle, for introducing this legislation, House File 1458. Warren is proposing a half cent sales tax to finance building a 10,000 square foot child care center and the projected sales tax revenue will pay the debt service on a $1.6 million bond. Warren is a town of 1,600 people in the northwest corner of the state. We are located 30 miles from Thief River Falls, Crookston, and Grand Forks, North Dakota. The city has embraced being a bedroom community with the robust employment options that have been available in northwest Minnesota. Six years ago, a child care center opened to provide child care to new residents of the community, um, this year's kindergarten class is 50 children. Last year, there was 29 high school graduates and the projected census from birth to four years old for the school district is 70 children each year. So we know that having a child care center works for growing a community and providing a workforce. Being a bedroom community, Warren provides 464 workers to the areas surrounding the city. 
That's according to housing study that was done in 2018. So that means one quarter of our residents drive to Thief River Falls, Crookston, or Grand Forks for work. 50% of the families at the child care center commute a distance of 30 miles or greater. And with the DigiKey expansion happening in Thief River Falls, it will provide a thousand additional jobs to the region. Warren needs to gear up to help provide that workforce that will be needed. Child care is the first thing that young couples look at when determining employment. Fall 2019, a survey by First Children's Finance showed there are 187 slots to be filled within the 20 mile radius of Warren. With the center and home child care in Warren, we're only filling 76 slots. People are gonna start leaving the region if they cannot find child care. Deed's profile in Northwest Minnesota shows a labor shortage for the upcoming decade. We're at a point of crisis to provide childcare to help provide a workforce to the area. That crisis has been highlighted in the newest child care report by the Center for Rural Policy and Development, in which the Northwest region, the region we live in, has the largest need in the state for child care capacity. Warren itself is a micro regional community. We have a bustling retail district and a robust housing market. There are 784 people employed in Warren and 66 people commute into the city. At the Child Care Center, 33% of the families commute to Warren to work. Warren serves a regional significance, not only in providing a workforce, but having jobs people commute to. A child care center that is double in size would be a huge boost to the region to help fill positions. The community right now is rallying around child care. The school district has teachers that may resign due to no in open infant slots. The hospital had 11 employees needing infant care. The nursing home has had trouble filling key management positions due to no available child care. These are Warren stories, but employers around the region tell a similar story. We had a town hall held on child care and it had 70 people that attended. That might seem like a small number, but First Children's Finance said it was the second largest attended event they had hosted. Um, and the first was in Winona County. So Warren wants to build a large center that will provide consistency and utilize economies of scale. Childcare and a new center are a hot topic and Warren leaders have worked together to create a solution. Community leaders have determined local sales tax is the revenue stream that is needed to provide investment for our region. Um, thank you, Madam Chair and community members and Representative Burkle for listening to our story this afternoon and for any support moving this legislation forward. Thank you, um, Ms. Martinson. Members, do we have any questions for Ms. Martinson or Representative Burkle? Um, Representative Anderson. Thanks, Madam Chair. I would just say uh, to the folks at Warren, uh, congratulations, you seem to be having a, a bustling community up there a lot of jobs and a lot of uh, things depending on getting this child care center up and running. So I just say hats off to you for, for addressing the situation, the problem, and good luck with the, as you move forward with this and hope you get it done. So thank you. Thank you, Representative Anderson. Any other comments, members? Oh, more hands, Representative Mortensen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative Mortensen, you went on mute there for a sec. Oh, all right. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to thank um, Mrs. Mortensen for having the courage to uh, come up front in front of this committee uh, with the last name Mortensen. I think that uh, takes some uh, courage. <laughs> thank you, Representative Mortensen. Um, members, any other questions? Seeing none, um, Representative Burkle, do you have any final comments? No, uh, I think everything's been said that needs to be thanks. Thanks for hearing this bill. Um, I think you can see that this is a real great solution for Warren and for the region. Um, we're lucky enough in Northwest Minnesota to have a lot of great um, manufacturers providing jobs. Um, and you heard her talk about the issues we've got with labor shortages and um, this childcare solution they've come up with is a smart one and I hope everyone supports it. 
Thank you, Representative Burkle. And I want folks to know everyone is welcome in committees. So <laughs> Representative Anderson renews his motion that House File 1458 be laid over for possible inclusion in the division report. Uh, members, uh, 1458 has been laid over. And now we have our final bill for the day. Um, the final bill on the agenda is House File 1304 from Representative Rasmussen. Can I get a motion to move House File 1304 before the division? I will so move, Madam Chair. Thank you, Chair Marquardt. Um, Representative Marquardt moves House File 1340, 1304 before the division. Um, and I see that we have a amendment labeled A1. Um, Representative uh, Rasmussen, would you like to describe your amendment briefly? I, I will move it, Madam Chair. I, uh, Representative Marquardt moves the I'll, amendment. I'll move the A1 amendment. Uh, thank you, Representative Marquardt. Representative Rasmussen, do you want to explain it? Briefly? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, yes, the author's amendment simply removes one project from Fergus Falls' proposal. Last year, Fergus Falls presented three projects to this committee, but the City Council has decided to prioritize uh, the two projects that we'll be discussing today. Thank you, Representative Rasmussen, and thank you, Representative Marquardt, for moving the amendment. Members, any questions on the amendment? Seeing them, please unmute yourself, and this will be a voice vote. Um, uh, Mr. Rasm uh, sorry, Representative Rasmussen moves the A1 amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, no. Um, the amendment is adopted. Mr. Uh, sorry, boy, it's been a long day. Fourth committee, who would have thought? Uh, Representative Rasmussen, would you like to go ahead and start your testimony? Thank you, Madam Chair, and I agree it has been a long day. Um, uh, and I really appreciate having the opportunity today to talk about House File 1304. Um, as this committee knows, the appropriate use of local option sales tax can help cities, particularly in greater Minnesota, grow and thrive. Among the difficulties that small cities face is having good paying jobs and community assets that make living in them vibrant and exciting. This proposal can provide both. Fergus Falls' approach to regional community enhancements has been through active and extensive engagement with its citizens. The projects you are hearing today have been vetted locally for years before making it into legislation. Alternative funding options have been considered and a review of regional assets has taken place. Two senior city council members are going to follow me to briefly discuss the two proposals we hope to put before the voters with your support of this legislation. After hearing from them, I believe you will be impressed with the efforts the city has taken to bring this legislation forward and the value they will bring to our region if approved. I'll first have council member Justin Arneson speak and he will be followed by council member Tom Rufer. There is a one page description of the pro projects in your committee file if you want to use that as a guide. When we conclude, we would be happy to answer any questions that the chair or committee members have. Uh, thank you again for giving us this hearing and we would ask for your support. Thank you, Representative Rasmussen. Um, which council member would like to go first? Madam Chair, I believe, I believe oh. we have a uh, council member, uh, Justin Arneson. Thank you, Representative Rasmussen. Council member Arneson, um, please state your name for the record and proceed. Justin Arneson, Fergus Falls City Council. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee for your time this afternoon. Just wanna give you a brief history. Um, there's a working group back in early 2000 that started a pool discussion and conversation within our community and completed a feasibility study. And in 2009, 2010, that fizzled out. About five years ago, uh, another committee uh, group of volunteers and community members that were passionate around this uh, created another working group. We partnered with uh, the local YMCA and our Fergus Falls High School and um, diving and swimming to uh, get those engagements with those organizations uh, in a process to move forward. Uh, we approached the city council and we created a, a new feasibility study. The other one was old and outdated. And so we partnered with U.S. Aquatics uh, to help guide us through that process. The main goal of the feasibility study was to um, engage our local residents and our regional residents to, so, to solicit uh, their feedback uh, through an online survey. Uh, we sent out surveys uh, at the end of the school year to the kids, so it got into their backpacks and at home, and uh, we solicited uh, to our community and our area to get that feedback. 
uh, through that, we incorporated that data into our design. And I believe you guys have a handout in front of you. Just wanna highlight a few of the high points of the aquatic center. Uh, zero entry pool would facilitate for young children and elderly people to get in and out of the pool. Um, it's two bodies of water. Uh, we have a lazy river that was identified not only for entertainment purposes, but also for um, aerobics, uh, conditioning, um, lap swimming against the current. Uh, we have a rock climbing wall, a um, couple of water slides, um, bathhouse, restrooms, concession area, and other related aquatic amenities. Uh, through that survey, we found overwhelming data that from the local and regional residents that participated, um, that they wanted to have an all-inclusive outdoor recreational water facility for all ages. Um, the regional significance, uh, the closest facility of this magnitude is in Hutchinson, which is over 150 miles away. Locally, we have a few pools, Pelican Rapids, Breck, WAP, uh, Parker's Prairie to note a few. Uh, they're just a traditional lap swim pool with maybe a slide or two. Um, so again, just wanna highlight in our region, like Detroit Lakes, Perm, Alexandria, uh, they, there isn't currently uh, an outdoor aquatic center of this magnitude. Um, some on the committee may think, you know, we live in lakes country and it's easy access to get to the lakes. And uh, we also heard from the respondents that not everybody has access to a lake cabin or a lake to go swimming. And this would be a safe place where um, families could have their kids swim. And, and again, it would be for all ages. Just to cap off a highlight, uh, the city council set a goal for the aquatics committee to fundraise locally $1.5 million up to uh, for this project. So I wanna note that, that there is a, uh, an expectation that the city council has set for that. Uh, and then Madam Chair, to conclude, I wanna thank you for your time, the committee uh, for hearing us this afternoon. Thank you, Councilmember Ernest and Councilmember Roofer. Good afternoon, thank you, Chair and members. Uh, thank you for allowing us the opportunity to address you today. Uh, my name is Tom Rufer, R-U-F-E-R, -E and I'm a member of the Fergus Falls City Council. We're asking you for your support in improving Gila Lagoon Park in Fergus Falls, which is located on the north shore of Pebble Lake on the edge of the city. The project consists of expanding our campground area and adding updated infrastructure, restrooms, and services. Also, we will be building new structures for restrooms and concessions, one of which will also serve our soccer fields with restrooms and concessions. This building would also be used by the local BMX club that has recently leased land from the city and constructed a new track by the lake. The project will also improve and expand the lighting throughout the park that would allow more sporting events to continue later into the evening. This project is going to benefit both our community and the region as a whole by bringing visitors to Fergus Falls, which will contribute to our tax base and get people spending their dollars at our local merchants. Our local baseball, softball, and soccer teams are very active and very passionate, and are all looking forward to the opportunity to host more and larger tournaments. For example, our Youth Soccer Association has been told by their counterparts in cities such as Moorhead, Detroit Lakes, and Alexandria that this facility would be a great location for tournaments as it's centrally located. The renovated and expanded campground and its proximity to the Central Lakes Trail will also draw visitors and help to increase our prominence statewide as a recreation destination while providing convenient camping for the users of the facility. Once people come to town for a tournament or a camp out or both, De Lagoon Park will stick in their minds as a place to which they will want to return. The residents of Fergus Falls and I are asking for your support of our projects and we sure appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Ruffer. Um, members, do we have any questions for either council members or Representative Rasmussen? Seeing none, um, I I have a quick question, Res Representative Rasmussen. How long is this uh, sales tax for? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. This sales tax would be collected if both projects are approved for 13 years. We would be maintaining Fergus Falls's current uh, one half of, of a percent sales tax, um, and uh, I I would say the only thing I would add is uh, the city of Fergus Falls always takes a very conservative approach and. Um, on previous projects has uh, you know, surpassed 
uh, their estimates. But uh, in the two proposals before you today, if they were both approved by the voters in 2022, it would be uh, 13 years uh, to pay them both back. Thank you, Representative Rasmussen. So this would bring the sales tax up to a cent? No, this would actually leave it at the current uh, one half uh, of one percent, one half percent um, sales tax. Got it. Thank you. Members, any other questions? Thank you, Representative Rasmussen. Final word then. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. I appreciate your attention to these uh, local option sales tax proposals today, and I appreciate uh, Council Member Arneson and Council Member Rufer for joining and uh, sharing the community's excitement to move forward with these proposals. I, I just really appreciate the thoughtful approach that the community has taken a grassroots approach to solicit input and align communities, uh, the community on these two projects. And so appreciate the hearing and uh, would ask for uh, your support. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Rasmussen. Um, with that, Representative Marquardt renews his motion that House File 1304 as amended be laid over for possible inclusion in the division report. So the bill is laid over. Um, members, thank you for your work today. Tomorrow we'll be meeting again at 1 p.m. during the tax committee time slot, courtesy of Chief Marquardt, to continue our journey across the state in the wonderful world of local option sales tax. So until then, we are adjourned. Thank you.